In fact, the last time in American history the national debt was completely paid off was in 1835 after President Andrew Jackson shut down the central bank that preceded the Federal Reserve. In fact, Jackson's entire political platform essentially revolved around his commitment to shut down the central bank, stating at one point, the bold efforts the present bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. Unfortunately, his message was short-lived and the international bankers succeeded to install another central bank in 1913 the Federal Reserve. And as long as this institution exists, perpetual debt is guaranteed. Now, so far we have discussed the reality that money is created out of debt, through loans. These loans are based on a bank's reserves, and reserves are derived from deposits. And through this fractional reserve system, any one deposit can create nine times its original value, in turn debasing the existing money supply raising prices in society. And since all this money is created out of debt and circulated randomly through commerce, people become detached from their original debt and a disequilibrium exists where people are forced to compete for labor in order to pull enough money out of the money supply to cover their costs of living. As dysfunctional and backwards as all of this might seem, there is still one thing we have omitted from this equation. And it is this element of the structure which reveals the truly fraudulent nature of the system itself. The application of interest. When the government borrows money from the Fed, or when a person borrows money from a bank, it almost always has to be paid back with accrued interest. In other words, almost every single dollar that exists must be eventually returned to a bank with interest paid as well. But, if all money is borrowed from the central bank and is expanded by commercial banks through loans, only what would be referred to as the principal is being created in the money supply. So then, where is the money to cover all of the interest that is charged? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. The ramifications of this are staggering, for the amount of money owed back to the banks will always exceed the amount of money that is available in circulation. This is why inflation is a constant in the economy, for new money is always needed to help cover the perpetual deficit built into the system, caused by the need to pay the interest. What this also means is that mathematically, defaults and bankruptcy are literally built into the system and there will always be poor pockets of society that get the short end of the stick. An analogy would be a game of musical chairs, for once the music stops, somebody is left out to dry. And that's the point. It invariably transfers true wealth from the individual to the banks. For if you are unable to pay for your mortgage, they will take your property. This is particularly enraging when you realize that not only is such a default inevitable due to the fractional reserve practice, but also because of the fact that the money that the bank loaned to you didn't even legally exist in the first place. In 1969, there was a Minnesota court case involving a man named Jerome Daly, who was challenging the foreclosure of his home by the bank, which provided the loan to purchase it. His argument was that the mortgage contract required both parties, being he and the bank, each put up a legitimate form of property for the exchange. In legal language, this is called consideration. Mr. Daly explained that the money was, in fact, not the property of the bank, for it was created out of nothing as soon as the loan agreement was signed. Remember what modern money mechanics stated about loans? What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes in exchange for credits. Reserves are unchanged by the loan transactions, but deposit credits constitute new additions to the total deposits of the banking system. In other words, the money doesn't come out of their existing assets. The bank is simply inventing it, putting up nothing of its own except for a theoretical liability on paper. As the court case progressed, the bank's president, Mr. Morgan, took the stand, and in the judge's personal memorandum, he recalled that, 
The plaintiff, Banks President, admitted that, in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank, did create the money and credit upon its books by bookkeeping entry. The money and credit first came into existence when they created it. Mr. Morgan admitted that no United States law or statute existed which gave him the right to do this. A lawful consideration must exist and be tendered to support the note. The jury found that there was no lawful consideration and I agree. He also poetically added, only God can create something of value out of nothing. And upon this revelation, the court rejected the bank's claim for foreclosure and daily kept his home. The implications of this court decision are immense. For every time you borrow money from a bank, whether it is a mortgage loan or a credit card charge, the money given to you is not only counterfeit, it is an illegitimate form of consideration and hence voids the contract to repay, for the bank never had the money as property to begin with. Unfortunately, such legal realizations are suppressed and ignored, and the game of perpetual wealth transfer and perpetual debt continues. And this brings us to the ultimate question. Why? During the American Civil War, President Lincoln bypassed the high interest loans offered by the European banks and decided to do what the Founding Fathers advocated, which was to create an independent and inherently debt-free currency. It was called the Greenback. Shortly after this measure was taken, an internal document circulated between private British and American banking interests stated, Slavery is but the owning of labor and carries with it the care of laborers. While the European plan is that capital shall control labor by controlling wages. This can be done by controlling the money. It will not do to allow the greenback, as we cannot control that. The fractional reserve policy perpetrated by the Federal Reserve, which has spread in practice to the great majority of banks in the world, is, in fact, a system of modern slavery. Think about it. Money is created out of debt. And what do people do when they are in debt? They submit to employment to pay it off. But if money can only be created out of loans, how can society ever be debt free? It can't. And that's the point. And it is the fear of losing assets coupled with the struggle to keep up with the perpetual debt and inflation inherent in the system, compounded by the inescapable scarcity within the money supply itself, created by the interest that can never be repaid, that keeps the wage slave in line. Running on the hamster wheel with millions of others, in effect powering an empire that truly benefits only the elite at the top of the pyramid. For, at the end of the day, who are you really working for? The banks. Money is created in a bank and invariably ends up in a bank. They are the true masters, along with the corporations and governments they support. Physical slavery requires people to be housed and fed. Economic slavery requires people to feed and house themselves. It is one of the most ingenious scams for social manipulation ever created, and at its core, it is an invisible war against the population. Debt is the weapon used to conquer and enslave societies, and interest is its prime ammunition. And as the majority walks around oblivious to this reality, the banks, in collusion with governments and corporations, continue to perfect and expand their tactics of economic warfare, spawning new bases, such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, while also inventing a new type of soldier, the birth of the economic hitman. We economic hitmen really have been the ones responsible for creating this first truly global empire. And we work many different ways. But perhaps the most common is that we will identify a, a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from 
the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects in their country, power plants, industrial parks, ports, things that benefit a few rich people in that country, in addition to our corporations, but really don't help the majority of the people at all. However, those people, the whole country is left holding a huge debt. It's such a big debt they can't repay it, and that's part of the plan that they can't repay it. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back to them and say, listen, you lost a lot of money, can't pay your debt, so sell your oil, real cheap to our oil companies. Allow us to build a military base in your country or send troops in support of ours to someplace in the world like Iraq or vote with us on the next UN vote to have their electric utility company privatized and their water and sewage system privatized and sold to U.S. corporations or other multinational corporations. So there was that whole mushrooming thing and it's so typical of the way the IMF and the World Bank work that you put a country in debt, and it's such a big debt it can't pay it, and then you offer to refinance that debt and, and, and pay even more interest. And you demand this quid pro quo, which you call a conditionality or good governance, which means basically that they've got to sell off their resources, in, in, including many of their social services, their utility companies, their school systems sometimes, their, their, their penal systems, their insurance systems, to foreign corporations. So it's a, it's a double, triple, quadruple whammy. The precedent for economic hitmen really began back in the early 50s when democratically elected Mossadegh, who was elected in Iran, he was considered to be the hope for democracy in the Middle East and around the world. He was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. But one of the things that he'd run on and began to implement was the idea that foreign oil companies needed to pay the Iranian people a lot more for the oil that they were taking out of Iran. The Iranian people should benefit from their own oil. Strange policy. We didn't like that, of course. But we were afraid to do what we normally were doing, which was to send in the military. Instead, we sent in one CIA agent, Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's relative. And Kermit went in with a few million dollars and was very, very effective and efficient. And in a short amount of time, he managed to get Mossadegh overthrown and brought in the Shah of Iran to replace him, who always was favorable to oil. And it was extremely effective. Mobs overflow Tehran. Army officers shout that Mossadegh has surrendered and his regime as virtual dictator of Iran is ended. Pictures of the Shah are paraded through the streets as sentiment reverses. The Shah is welcomed home. So back here in the United States, uh, in Washington, people looked around and said, wow, that was easy and cheap. So this established a whole new way of manipulating countries, of, of creating empire. The only problem with Roosevelt was that he was a card-carrying CIA agent. And had he been caught, the ramifications could have been pretty serious. So very quickly at that point, the decision was made to use private consultants to, to, to channel the money through the World Bank or the IMF or one of the other such agencies to bring in people like me who worked for private companies. So that if we got caught, there would be no governmental ramifications. When Arbenz became president of Guatemala, the country was very much under the thumbs of United Fruit Company, the, the big international corporations. And Arbenz ran on this ticket that says, you know, we want to get the land back to the people. And once he took power, he was, he was implementing policies that would, that would do exactly that, give the land rights back to the people. United Fruit didn't like that very much. And so they hired a public relations firm, launched a huge campaign in the United States to convince the United States the people, the citizens of the United States, and the press of the United States, and the Congress of the United States, that Arbenz was a so Soviet puppet. And that if we allowed him to stay in power, the Soviets would have a foothold in this, uh, in this hemisphere. And, and that, at, at that point in time, was a huge fear on everybody's mind, the Red Terror, the Communist Terror. And so, to make a long story short, out of this public relations campaign came a commitment on the part of the CIA and the military to take this man out. And in fact, we did. We sent in planes, we sent in, we sent in soldiers, we sent in jackals, we sent everything in to take him out, and did take him out. And as soon as he was removed from office, the new guy that took over after him basically reinstated everything to the big international corporations, including the United Fruit. 
Ecuador for many, many years had been ruled by pro-U.S. dictators, often relatively brutal. Then it was decided that they were going to have a truly democratic election. Jaime Roldos ran for office, and his main goal, he said, as president would be to make sure that Ecuador's resources were used to help the people. And he won, overwhelming, by more votes than anybody had ever won anything in Ecuador. And he began to implement these policies to make sure that the profits from oil went to help the people. Well, we didn't like that in the United States. I was sent down as one of several economic hitmen to change Roldos, to corrupt him.